responsive. It is 10 o'clock and this uh, workshop session of the City Council uh, is in order. Uh, we begin with <coughs> public comments. If anyone uh, would like to address an item on the agenda, um, and then you may do so at this time. Uh, that may be in form of a question or whatever, and we would come back to that later. Uh, I will say that the item 3B is off the agenda, uh, the active shooter training, and uh, we will deal with that at another time. All right, then let's move to item two, information and discussion. Uh, Ms. McElhannon. Briefing and possible action regarding preparedness and response to COVID-19 coronavirus. All right. So before the chief starts, just real quick, um, and I've got a copy coming down, but um, as all of you are aware, the mayor issued an emergency declaration yesterday. And so you'll get a copy of that to see what it specifically says, but it was pretty well summarized in the press conference that we had. Um, and the chief's going to go into a little more detail on some of that. And we're really today's session is about answering your questions and questions that you might be getting from the public, um, you know, since we met last. Um, the other thing is, um, Shelley is talking to the Secretary of State about elections and what options we've got. Uh, we've not got any definitive um, uh, guidance on that at this point, but we're uh, in constant contact with them as well as the county who administers our elections because it obviously affects their primary runoff as well. Uh, so we'll be getting you information on that as soon as we know. And then um, city council meetings. Uh, we, we anticipate that your Friday special called meeting on the same subject will continue just like we're doing today but we are looking at alternatives for your regular meeting next Tuesday, um, including teleconferencing and a way to dispatch people in, uh, meaning the public, to comment and participate in the meeting without being here. So um, all of that's in the works, and uh, you'll hear more as that, that comes together or not. Uh, but with that, I'm gonna turn over to the Chief, and he, we've got a special guest here also from HEB who he'll, he'll introduce uh, after he's done making some comments. Chief? Thank you, City Manager. Good morning, Mayor and members of Council. Um, on March 10th, Tuesday of last week, um, we spent some time with you as a Council and we just provided an overview for you of COVID-19, what was happening there. And I think some of the information we share with you was the facts and fears. Uh, we discussed with you the signs and symptoms and protective actions you could take, um, not only here in the Council chambers, but at home to stop the spread of germs. Uh, we even discussed with you um, our NXH, which specifically deals with... Uh, Ethan, I'm sorry, can you speak up just sure. a little bit? We specifically uh, shared with you um, a little information on NXH, which deals with a pandemic or, you know, a virus similar to what COVID-19 is. Uh, and then we talked to you about what the city was doing, you know, moving into phase three of the pandemic plan. On yesterday, uh, the city manager has mentioned uh, there was a joint press conference hail, um, where um, in that press conference, you know, the goal uh, of the mayor and the group that was assembled on yesterday was just to share with the community the latest information that was available to us um, that both you and the community could have. Um, as the city manager said, everything is fluid. It's constantly moving. On yesterday when we held the press conference, uh, the CDC had just issued guidelines that um, recommending that no mass gatherings in excess of uh, 50 people be held. That has now changed and it, the recommendation is 10. Um, the city manager discussed in, um, in the press conference, the mayor provided the community with information regarding uh, the disaster declaration that was issued on yesterday, uh, which basically allows him to um, take whatever protective measures he needs to combat uh, COVID-19 <coughs> in the city of Kerrville. Uh, as of you, noon on yesterday, I'll share with you what the CDC numbers and what's been reported out of John Hopkins University that's tracking the coronavirus numbers across the world. Uh, in the world, um, there's been, as of noon yesterday, 
179,073 confirmed COVID-19 cases in the world. <clears throat> of that total number of cases, um, there's been 7,074 deaths. In the United States, uh, 4,138 confirmed cases and 71 deaths. Uh, in Texas, 57 confirmed cases. And uh, when we did a press conference on yesterday, there was zero deaths in the mm -hmm. state of Texas. But it's now being reported that Texas has its first death, a mm -hmm. uh, 91-year-old gentleman in Matagora, Texas. So um, when we take a look at Kerrville today, uh, as of today, there's been um, no COVID-19 cases reported. <laughs> and we're not aware of any uh, COVID-19 cases in the city of Kerrville are in Kerr County. However, uh, we shouldn't um, get laxed in our approach to taking whatever action we need to make sure we protect the community because uh, simply that there's been none reported here, it doesn't mean we're out of harm's way uh, or, or that it won't turn up here in Kerrville. Uh, so I also want to just touch bases with you on um, some things that the community is doing that I think uh, we commended them on yesterday in the press conference. And, um, um, you know, as a council, you know, I, I think it's what you want to see the community uh, doing. They're heeding the information that the CDC is providing that we're sharing with them. And they're doing what they can do to basically uh, support our efforts and uh, slow or stop the spread of uh, COVID-19 in our community. So to give you just a snapshot of what that looks like, um, Chick-fil-A closed the dining service and they're only allowing, they only have their drive through open. And we have HEB here, uh, Greg Nichols, he's going to provide you an overview of uh, what HEB is doing and what the supply chain looks like now and, you know, what, it, what will happen in the future. Walmart has uh, changed its hours. It's no longer open 24 hours. It's, uh, it's opening at 6 a.m. in the morning, closing at 11 p.m. at night. The Kerr County Jail has suspended uh, visitation until further notice. Um, Peterson Regional Medical Center has implemented visitor screening and other restrictions. Um, the Low League is, I think they've gotten a decision on yesterday that uh, to suspend uh, the Low League uh, games, I'm not sure the date on that, I'll get that updated and get it to you. Uh, the local churches are implementing social distancing. It's a practice that um, we've recommended, the CDC has recommended, and you can see it happening in this room today with the distance we put between people. It's a practice where you just put a little distance between you and the next person. Um, Notre Dame School, at the direction of the Archdiocese of San Antonio, is closed until Friday, April 3rd. Uh, Our Lady of the Hills has also suspended school. Uh, Shrine University will open after spring break, but are making internal modifications and they've closed a diner to the public. Starbucks has removed all chairs and all condiments are behind the counter in response to the mass gathering recommendations coming from the city and the CDC. The Dietert Center has canceled all functions uh, with the exception of their Meals on Wheels program. And then Playhouse uh, 2000 has canceled a scheduled performance that was uh, due to take place on Saturday, and I think it was called Celtic Angels Ireland. So with that, I'll uh, ask Greg to come up and give you an overview of what's happening with HEB, and then I'll be back to make myself available for any questions if you have any. Morning, Council. Morning. Um, Morning. Thanks for letting me. Um, I apologize for the dress, but I've been up since 2 a.m. this morning and uh, dealing with some uh, supply chain issues that we're trying to fill. So kind of let me uh, give you an update on what HEB is doing. Um, we have a COVID-19 conference call every day about 11 o'clock uh, to give us a whole company update. We also have a COVID-19 website set up for all of our partners that they can go to uh, if they have any questions or feel like they're coming down with anything. There's a Blue Cross Blue Shield nurse on call 24-7, 365 days a year. It's free for all of our 107,000 partners to use. Uh, we've extended medical leave to everybody 
whether they're part-time or full-time or whether they're even on our medical plan, if they happen to come down with COVID-19 or any family member comes down with it, then if they're out for the required 14-day uh, quarantine period, then they're paid for that period of time too. Um, from a maintenance standpoint, <clears throat> we have kind of shut down uh, our floral departments uh, right now to shift those bodies into other areas of the store. We, uh, we've shut down our hot table in the deli. Uh, we have prepackaged all of our bread. Uh, we will stop making bread as of today as far as through the bakery uh, because we're shifting those resources uh, into other areas of the store. Uh, so once we're out there, uh, we'll, we'll be out. But we had prepackaged everything where it used to be where you could just grab it and package it yourself. Olive Bar has been shut down and prepackaged, uh, so all that's out there. And then sliced meats and cheeses, uh, starting tomorrow, uh, we'll pretty much start just prepackaging all that uh, from a social distancing uh, standpoint for that. In the next two days, you'll see all of our check stands across the whole uh, state of Texas. They'll have sneeze guards put on in between our checkers and the customers uh, so that there's a little bit more protection, uh, not only for the customer, but for our partners too. Um, we're lining them up. We're, our hours are operating hours are 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And we did that uh, strictly so that we had more time to restock every day because there's a lot of panic buying uh, going on right now. So we have the limits in place in a number of different areas. Uh, but for example, toilet paper is running out about every 30 minutes to an hour in every store across our whole state. And it's not because we're not getting toilet paper in, because we're getting toilet paper in every single night. It's just that we seem to uh, have a hoarding situation going on where uh, people are coming in every day and buying toilet paper. And so it's uh, water. We're in good shape in water. We're in good shape company-wide in toilet paper. It's just a matter of when you try to ship what it takes to fill a whole aisle, that's really a whole trailer load and a half. So we're trying to cube out the trailers as best we can each night. So we're averaging about seven to nine trailers a, a day into the store just from our warehouses. Each trailer holds about 30 to 32 pallets, depending on the length of the trailer. Um, so for an example, last night we got 85 pallets just on dry grocery uh, in. Um, and it doesn't look like that today, but that's, that's what was put into the store <laughs> last night. So we're right now just shipping um, categories that we're seeing that are just flying out. So it's categories like, you know, we continue to get fresh bread in, uh, milk. We're not getting all milks, it's mainly just gallons. Uh, paper towels, uh, we're shipping dry dog food, 32 um, ounces or more every other day now because that cubes out the trailers a little less and we can ship some other things. So those are just some things that uh, we're doing. Um, we've added hand sanitizer uh, dispensers in each front lobby as you walk in so that people have those. There's hand sanitizers at every register. Um, we continue to clean like we always have done. We have a, a quality assurance team um, and the monitors us throughout the state, but we also have a total sanitation team that comes in every night and has in every store uh, before this that they completely sanitize everything down. Um, they hit all the cooler doors, all the handles, uh, everything else. Every night. We just have started doing that a little bit more since all this has been uh, going on. Um, curbside, uh, our instructions to our Kirby's that go out to uh, the folks that have ordered is that uh, the customer does not touch the iPad uh, and they social distance from the window and kind of tell them what their uh, substitutions are and then uh, they load them and they're on their way at that point. Um, I, I guess the best thing I can tell you guys is the common theme that we are having out there is that we just need to somehow calm the public that there's plenty of adequate food out there. Uh, it's not a matter of there's not food out there. It's a matter of the supply chain being able to get out there. So what we have shifted, we've added, <clears throat> gone out and bought a lot more trailers, a lot more that. We have hired some additional drivers that aren't driving for Cisco because some restaurants are shut down. So we continue to add drivers just to employ them temporarily to continue to bring stuff to our stores. Uh, some of our direct store <laughs> delivery drivers like Budweiser and all that, when they're not driving for them, they're picking up loads for us and bringing them to the store. So we started that as of yesterday. Um, <laughs> produce, um, just yesterday alone, was about three times what we normally ship, uh, is what was ordered across the whole capacity. So in produce, it's a matter of we're just trying to get big commodities, bananas, potatoes, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, 
We're not shipping some of the bagged vegetables and that kind of stuff that are convenience items. We're just trying to get bagged fruit and, and the basics into the stores at this point. Um, we had a ton of ground beef land in our warehouse uh, yesterday. Uh, and when I say a ton, it's not, it's just a lot. <laughs> uh, we believe you if you yeah. say a ton. So they, uh, they're getting that out to the stores. We got a bunch more in this morning. We got chicken in again this morning and everything else. Um, as a company, we're making a $2 million commitment to the food banks across the uh, state um, by providing cash support for them to go out and purchase anything they need. Uh, we're partnering with Meals on Wheels to try to get kids uh, and elderly some meals. Um, you know, I know one of the questions is how do we get the elderly in there quicker or uh, that. We're still working through that as a company. It's how do we do that fairly and without getting somebody hurt? Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we're we're basically bringing in 50 people at a time in the mornings. Uh, we're lining them up outside. Uh, we have someone going down the line uh, with hand sanitizer. If people want to do that. Uh, social distancing is about the length of a shopping cart and somebody else. Uh, so if they'll stay within that distance, they'll be pretty good in, in the line. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing. That's the best update I can give you. I mean, without going into a, a lot of detail, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Yes, um, thank you. you um, thank you for this update and for all that you're doing. I have a question about the curbside. Mm -hmm. um, I would guess that that was encouraged, but there may be some delay in the timing of that. I know I went on yesterday to try and do a curbside order, and that might be a little bit complicated right now. So what would you say about that? Yeah, so what we've done uh, statewide, and we just opened it back up, is we reduced everything down to only about 30% capacity on curbside. Um, this last week because we just had such a surge um, and uh, so we felt like that would get us through kind of the surge. Uh, what it did was it just shifted it day by day. So we opened it up a little bit yesterday to 60%. We're at 100% capacity this morning for us. We're going to see how that goes. Um, but as you know, if you order curbside, you're going to have a lot of substitutions right now just because mm -hmm. we're out of stuff. Um, we're trying to take it off the website as quick as we run out, uh, but there's some delay there just based on the volume that's happening. Okay, good. But that would, I mean, I would think that that would be a, a good practice. If, yeah, it, if, it's if a great it practice. Works, the problem is our, our really limitations wrong. are, um, and I, you know, I'm welcome to, if you guys want to walk through at some point, I'll show you how kind of curbside works in the store, but uh, we're limited on refrigeration capacity and frozen food capacity, um, and that's a whole separate uh little area there and so we run about 1100 to 1200 customers through there a week uh, on a pretty good basket order uh, per and that takes 1100 people off the parking lot which is great but that's about our capacity yeah. at, at this particular now the new store will be able to do probably about three times that but at, at this point that's our capacity rate at where we're at okay thank you you bet Thank you. I just want to say thank you to H E B and yes. your yeah, staff. Ex and, uh, you know, exactly. We could all have that type You're of on the front lines. <laughs> response. We, things would be a lot different. Well, and I appreciate I, the I really do appreciate yeah. what you guys are doing. And, it, and the Butt family and the, and the corporation. And the calming measures that that yes. provides the community on top of everything mm -hmm. else too. Just and I appreciate you working with Meals on Wheels and, and those that need that extra help. So it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be more to come. We'll announce some of that as we kind of partner with them and see what how that's going to work. A lot depends on how long the schools are being closed because we're going to try to get some kids fed because we know there's and a need out there. That was my concern but, too. So. Um, but uh, talking to the superintendents yesterday, they right now they're still on for next week. They didn't know for sure, yeah. so uh, we'll just see how that works. Well, thank you for your donation too, uh, because I've been concerned about if, in fact, on Thursday they do keep the schools closed, there will be kids who won't have lunches or breakfast that they would typically get at school. So I'm, I'm going to, I was going to reach out to uh, Dr. Faust and others, principals of schools and just see, is there anything we could be doing uh, as a community to help, you know, uh, help that out, help that situation out as far as food, at least for the kids. Meals and Wheels, speaking with Brenda Thompson at Dieter is perfect. I mean, she'll gladly show you how you can help there, but thank you. That's great to know. If the schools do close, they're making arrangements for some um, okay. drive-through yeah. deliver, you know, go okay. through and pick up the meals. Oh, that's you know, great. For the kids. What, y'all are already on top of that. Well, the school from, district is. Well, yeah, I'm sure they were probably uh, thinking about it. From the HEB staff, uh, <clears throat> what, are you, what are you hearing people 
wanting to know, anxious about, you know, that kind of thing? I know it's pretty general. But. Yeah, it, it's, you know, mainly just, you know, it's the common question, when you get toilet paper back in, when you get water back <laughs> in, um, you know, are you going out of business, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and <laughs> what I would tell everybody, I mean, and y'all know this, so I'm not, I'm preaching to the crowd, but if you look across the whole U.S. right now, it's just not us. It's it's everybody out yeah. there. There's these runs on grocery stores that, and I've been doing this for 43 years, even though uh, I only have 31 on my name badge with H-E-B, but I did it with 12 years with Randall's before that. And I've never in the history of, have seen this, even hurricanes or anything else. This is kind of unprecedented. And, mm. um, you know, quite frankly, it, it's not a matter of it's not out there. It's out there. It's just getting it into the warehouses mm -hmm. and the warehouses being able to get it out to the stores and then the stores being able to just restock. Typically a new store, we, we take a whole month with just trailer after trailer after trailer running in to fill it. Uh, and that's not open. So, I mean, you're going to see that when we open the new one. Uh, but trying to refill what people are coming in and, and constantly buying the same things over and over and over, that's what's causing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you experiencing Kerrville kindness in the store? Yeah, I mean, everybody's been great. I mean, we haven't had any fights break out. Um, I mean, the general public's been, I mean, very, very good. Uh, they've been very appreciative of all of our staff and everything else. And, um, I mean, it's been pretty lighthearted. So, I mean, and that, but that's the way Kerrville is. So I, I can't speak for the rest of the state of Texas, but I, I know it's been fine here. Uh, we do have a security guard, you know, every morning when we open, and that's just to kind of calm fears uh, if anybody thought there was going to be riots or that kind of stuff. But everybody's been, I mean, very good about coming in orderly and not pushing. And, you know, if we have someone that's handicapped that we put in front of somebody, that they're fine with it. So we haven't had any issues. Yeah. I have to say that I firsthand experienced the that hospitality when I was in line at 745 on Sunday morning. They're walking down the line with a squirt of sanitizer. And by the way, here's your breakfast bar. So, oh. uh, it, and it, it has a calming effect. So just another great mm -hmm. way that HEB takes care of the community. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, the, uh, well, I, I, I was going to ask, but I don't think we need to go there. But it, it seems like some of the HEB's responses over the years to disasters relates to this but as you mentioned, it's it's a different deal. Yeah, I, I don't. I didn't bring it up, but we, we have a whole disaster team that as soon as a disaster hits, we we open that command center, and they're on until it's over. So there's probably about 75 to 100 people that are in that, and it's from all ends of the company, from transportation to warehousing to IT to, to uh, that. But we we have an emergency uh, manager on staff. Um, that that's all he does. He monitors weather, he monitors that. So he gives us an update, just like the chief did on how many deaths in the state of Texas, if any, and how many cases and all that. Uh, we have a, you know, a mobile kitchen. We have some mobile pharmacies that we can put in, mobile water, and everything else. So, you know, we've been doing, this isn't our first rodeo, so to speak, as far as disasters. It's just, this is kind of unprecedented and as far as the runs on the stores. We're used to seeing runs on the stores. If it's a hurricane, the coast or yeah. you know there's some flooding and that kind of stuff but uh, this and, is kind of statewide uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and not a timeline we don't have a definite time as to when it might change right. like the hurricane's gone and right. relief comes in and so yeah it's yeah. different well thank you thank you, you know, very much yes yeah. hope Thanks. you get some sleep oh, we'll, we'll do fine we'll survive <laughs> thank, Thanks, thank you Greg. okay thank you Greg, and for coming over at a short notice there's just one more item I want to mention to the council, and uh, you may have saw it, those of you who've had the chance to watch the news conference. Uh, we do have a joint operations center set up with uh, Peterson and the county and our emergency operations center. Uh, there is um, the ability to provide email from the citizens to send an email in. But there's also a hotline where they'll be answering the most frequently asked questions. It's going to be open from 8 to 5, and then afterwards we'll have a recorded line available for after hours. So I think that's um, that concludes what I had to say to you today. Will I'll you take any questions you might Will you repeat have. that number, the oh. hotline? It's 258-1111. Okay. Uh, Council, you have questions, Yes. Or including questions that you've been asked that we might need to clarify? I do. Uh, about testing, so 
I actually spoke with my primary care physician this morning about how she handles screening, and she was she told me that the way it works is if they're they're screening everyone no matter why they're there for their appointment, and if it looks like they have any kind of symptoms, they will they have to request the state for the test. Is that correct? There's a test inside in San Antonio. So how does that work logistically? Person comes into the doctor's office. He, they, that person is suspicious, perhaps. Um, they do the swab. Do they have the ability to do the swab there? Now, I don't know if the local uh, I don't think physician's they do. office have the ability yeah. to do the test. So they'd refer them? Uh, yes. They okay. Would, uh, well, let me back up now. This is kind of out of my lane, but I'll do the best I can with it. Uh, they're going to have to meet a certain criteria in terms of signs and symptoms. And uh, everybody that, you know, has a cold or flu-like right. symptoms doesn't necessarily meet that criteria of, you know, what is shown mm -hmm. for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So um, the information that's been provided is, you know, contact your physician. And then they would either, here at Kerrville, be referred to Peterson, you know, which then would refer them to the uh, testing facility for COVID-19. San Antonio. Okay, I was just curious what what process was in place in case in case someone did not pass the screening at the physician's office. Yeah, they have to they have to go through the screening first, and then um, our EMS is also very uh, plugged into all this, and and they know how to refer people to the, to get the testing if they're pretty certain that this is you know a potential right. case. But they're going to rule out other things first. Right. Um, so they may be doing some testing, but it's not necessarily for, for COVID-19 right. locally. There's really good protocol online if you'll just look it up. Okay. Uh, there's excellent resources from the CDC that tells you what the steps are if you think you've been exposed or if you're exhibiting symptoms. And it, it, it does it just call your doctor, do this, do this, do this. I so, think some of the people I've been talking to were under the impression they would be tested at their physician's office that day. And I, I, I didn't think that was correct, so I just wanted to verify. Yeah, I, I don't believe yeah. the individual physis physicians have the ability to That's do good. that. So right. that actually looks like a citizen traveling to San Antonio to mm -hmm. a facility with a referral to get tested? Yes. So. Yes. Okay. Thank you. It have, may be that the testing is available locally once they get enough of that out, but right now we don't have it. I mean, are, we, is there, are, are there transport options considered of someone that's severe? That's or? why EMS is involved yes. so that in, would in coordination be with the hospital. coordinated yeah. effort. Because they track all the cases, and they want to know who, and so they're, they want to know specifically where you're coming from, where you're going. So and in that extreme case, we could see our EMS <clears throat> transporting to San Antonio? A absolutely. If someone presented in Kerrville with um, COVID-19 uh, symptoms, that would be a dialogue between uh, Kerrville for fire and EMS with Peterson, mm -hmm. and they may not be transported to Peterson. Uh, mm, our go. EMS may transport them to San Antonio. And would that look like them potentially coming back to Kerrville for hospital-type quarantine that's available uh, just to be determined if something like that happens? Because I know we've got the, the hospital has has space. Yeah, it, it could be patients. treatment at the hospital or it could be <clears throat> self-quarantine, okay. you know, at, at their home. I understand from my doctor, though, that it's a pretty stringent uh, screening process, so it's not like um, there may be some, you know, weaknesses with that. There's, it's a pretty strict screening process, so it's you're pretty, if someone de were to test, they would have been ruling out a whole lot of other things, so. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? The press conference yesterday was very good. I have some, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll go after well, you. Not, mine's not for chief. Oh, okay. Um, so the daily briefing sheet we talked about last week, where you kind of have that updated list, does that? Where does that get pushed out beyond beyond your command center, so to speak? We have it on our website. Um, you're, are you talking about where I gave the the stats, numbers in the world, the U.S. and mm -hmm. Texas? Yeah, we um, we just started it last week. It's something that we update on a weekly basis. So it's and, a weekly uh, update? Yes. Okay. We will put it on the website, although it's uh, what we have up today is last week's information. 
because we've been snowballed with yeah, everything else. That's, but I'll get it updated in that's, today. You're right. You're right. That's not the first priority. Um, I did. I had another question, and, and this may be um, Mark or, or Chief. Um, I had a question from a member of the community saying that they had, were aware of an event in a neighboring community that would draw um, a larger number of people, perhaps. I don't have any knowledge of this event per se, but is there coordination or any kind of, I, I wouldn't say influence, but any kind of conversation that that our community may have with neighboring communities if there's you know, knowledge of a larger event taking place near where we are, just to have that coordination of. Uh, I find it hard to believe that the that, that neighboring community would have a larger event right now, but if but what what would we potentially do in that situation? The, so go ahead, Chief. The community you're speaking of is it in Kerr County? No, it's in an adjoining county. Okay, so um, there's a um, first. Let me start with Kerr County. Um, you know, the city is coordinating sure. right. countywide with right. Kerr County, and then with Peterson also. Mm -hmm. The conference call that um, we have with the state is there are several conference calls we do one that's statewide mm -hmm. and we do one specifically for our Department of State Health Services mm -hmm. region, which would be all the counties in the ACOG region. So um, the information that's coming to us is coming to those surrounding counties and the recommendations and uh, coordination should be happening similar um, without knowing the specific event. Uh, sure. I mean, I would want to check it before yeah, I would. Just about publicly. everybody is. Well, I, 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 I still have to believe you. You can't, I mean. You can't make. People have to use their common sense if they know it's a large gathering and they've been warned and warned and warned not to go to large gatherings. The city or the county or the state can't be responsible for those people. I don't think it's a responsibility. It's just a, a, a conversation, you know. So in addition to what the chief provided, we communicate on a regular basis with other city managers in the region, and we've, we've already been talking about how we're dealing with council meetings, how we're dealing with just a number of issues. Um, and so the issue really we have is each community is making their own decisions about what those limits are. There's recommendations from the CDC, but it's only the mayor and the county judge that can do that de declaration and right. say, you will not have these events over... So we've chosen to make recommendations. A lot of cities have done that. Some cities have made it mandatory. Uh, but each, each community stands alone in terms of their jurisdiction and their authority for their emergency declarations. Right. And, and I will say, Council Member, that um, I described some of the actions that um, just our community partners are taking. You know, looks like most are heeding the warnings. And that's not just happening at a local level. It seems like on a national level, people are really taking this serious and taking the appropriate actions. But, you know, it's not um, impossible to have somebody that, that doesn't heed the recommendations. I think, I think the fear is just if no, if, if you know, is there any, is there any coordination? And just have that discussion about what would potentially happen if, you know, there was a spread and there were people coming in, including our community, based on an event that was taking place over in a week over a weekend type um, situation. So I, I said I would ask. And um, the other one um, is about communication. I was asked, you know, uh, if someone's not on social media um, and they don't have access to the usual means of communication, um, uh, things things that we may be able to do in addition to that. I mean, I, that's always the challenge, right? I'm, you know, um, the, you know, sometimes we put messages in utility billing, or or how else can we push the messaging beyond what we're already doing for people that may not have those primary um, controls that the city is using to push out their messaging? I think that's the primary reason, uh, if not, well, it's the main reason that we opened the EOC the joint operation is so that we could push information out. It's not that we really have a 24 hour emergency that we're managing seven days a week, although we're monitoring very closely that the real, the real reason for opening that is to improve communications and coordination. So the best thing they can do is call that number. Right. And, but if they, if they don't have access to the computer, now the computer is going to have a whole lot more information, our own website, has local information. It has, also has links to pertinent information right. for the region and the state and, and beyond CDC. Right. 
So that is really good uh, uh, information. Uh, and the newspaper's been also right. putting out a lot of good information about the local situation. Right. In my mind, the phone number, if, if, you're, if you're limited on any other kind of communications, just knowing that phone number, if that's, if that's everybody can hopefully dial that phone number. Um, so, I mean, something as simple as, you know, changing the messaging and utility billing to say, you know, here's the phone number mm -hmm. with a, you know, um, for up-to-date information, here's the website, just those little things and every opportunity that we can beyond beyond the normal um, messaging that we send out. We can look at the utility bill. That would be a good idea. Uh, Chief, uh, from what Councilman Cochran said, uh, I think we continue to point everybody to the CDC website. Now, in meeting Friday afternoon, we were asking, okay, are we all saying the same thing on our website? And everybody, hospital, school district, city, so forth, said, uh, we're using the info from CDC. And so that continues to be a, a, a go-to place that's pretty basic. And then for local information, then the local uh, website, city, fire department, and school, county. Yeah, I think you're right. We've done a number of uh, public safety announcements and those on the website, you know, we have tried to get as much information as we possibly can on the website. And then there's links to, uh, to the CDC to try to make it easy for people to access what the um, CDC is saying and what they're recommending. And, and like Councilman Cochran said, uh, there's just a ton of information there from the CDC. Even I think our last meeting, um, Councilmember Sigmund, you had a question about travel. You know, mm -hmm. it, it talks specifically about travel. If you're, you know, traveling to the different zones, what they recommend. Public you comments. know, um, so you you can Public find just comments. about anything you want, and, and we'll continue to do the best we can to uh, to make sure that. Through PSAs and, uh, and I think we ought to. I mean, the, the public needs to be warned that there is so much misinformation out there. Also, don't <laughs> don't get your information off Facebook. Don't get your information right. off right. one of the other social media right. sites. Right. Go to the go to the expert because right. uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, there's so many people out there trying to take advantage of folks right. at this point in time. And, and that's why I asked the question about the update on the stats because I've gotten several people come to me you know, on a regular basis, you know, are there any cases, are there any cases, are there any cases, or I heard, I heard, I heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a, you know, as a council member, I, you know, have um, reached out to Mark, and it's my understanding that that pipeline will come to us through you once there is a confirmed case. And so that's what I'm telling the public now. But, you know, just to let anyone know that wants to know here in Kerrville, Texas, right now, what's the most up-to-date information? And I will back that up and just say, it's certainly not a criticism. I, I probably didn't compliment you in, as much as I should have on what you are doing. My comment was really more geared towards those people that just don't use what we consider to be the everyday <clears throat> tools, like getting online or, you know, checking social media, whatever, whatever it is, just to make sure those people don't get, you know, that group of citizens don't get left out of out of the you know information chain well and I think this is where we can encourage a personal responsibility if you've got a neighbor if you've got somebody that you know may not have access to that kind of information that it's a, a personal responsibility of ours to reach out to them and uh, make sure that that they do know. You know so. not, even if there was a PDF or something that we could print with local information or we could, you know, have on if, if for someone to print and give to a neighbor or to what, you know, to hand off if, if that's um, something that we could do, that's a great idea as well. Just I have one more quick question. If there were to be a confirmed case, um, how? It's when. <laughs> no, it's if. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I've heard talk that people think there has been a case and we just don't want them to know it. And, uh, and I've said, no, that's not true. <laughs> we, we'd report the facts, whatever they are. But is there a certain protocol for how that would be handled as far as making that announcement? Uh, that yeah, there was a case? It would be announced. Probably uh, in the CDC, I'm sure. But Yeah, it would be. Okay. It would be updated through the CDC and confirmed, just like I gave you the numbers this okay. morning, that uh, here's what we have in Texas. 
uh, as of yesterday, there was zero deaths, but now um, there's um, one, and it's been in Matagorda. So we're not going to be able to uh, hoard that information. It's going to become public, and not just by us, but right. it's going to make the national news. So, so one of the thing in terms of uh, when we're talking about a bad, bad information on the internet. Uh, Apparently, there are some malicious sites, email sites that, that said COVID-19 information or whatever. You click on it, and you got trouble. So we've got to be, uh, we go to the, be careful. Go to the CDC. Yeah. That's the yeah. only one. Yeah. And I think That's, one of the things we highlighted yesterday is that, um, you know, CDC is where we're going to get, you know, is, is the direction that we're following in the recommendations. They are the professional authority to be able to make those recommendations and determinations. Mm -hmm. All right. Karen, I have some other questions that I'd like to direct to the city manager regarding the COVID-19 situation. Is that still appropriate? Yes. Yeah. Mark, could you just give us an update? I'm, you know, as in my limited knowledge of looking at city budgets, how do you all, and I know y'all are working on this, but how do you foresee the impact short-term, long-term sales tax, hot money, property taxes? So we don't know because we did, the world's really never experienced anything like this in modern time. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're looking at worst case. And so I've already, for example, advised the staff that there's no more travel and training until further notice, um, that we're going to have a hiring slowdown, which means that if it's not a police and fire position that we're going to, uh, it's got to go through me to be approved, be filled. So, uh, you know, we're, when you're 80 to 90% staff, that's where your, most of your costs are. And so it's balancing that also though, than having enough people that are going to be well enough and healthy enough to carry out the services because city hall still has to run. We still have to have police and fire and water and, and water and, you know, the essential services. So, that's, that's where the priority has been placed. Uh, but, um, you know, when you look at um, sales tax and go back to the recession, we saw a 10% dip. And, um, you know, that wasn't that significant, quite frankly. Uh, so we, you know, we're looking at what, what if it's more than that? And then what, ha what, what happens? We've got great reserves, <clears throat> and that's what they're there for. We also have contingency funding, which is that that's what it's there for, built into the operating budget. Um, and then, um, you know, other than that, when you look at hotel tax, we've got a very large reserve for hotel mm -hmm. tax. We have some plans for possibly using some of that, but we, we haven't and we won't until we know what the future holds. So um, I think we're in great shape financially, and we're already taking steps to make sure that you know, we can endure uh, for several months. Um, and that's, that's, what, that's why we have that policy about our fund balance, and that's what it's there for. It's 15%, but we're, we're well above that in terms of our reserve. So uh, financially, we're already looking at <clears throat> what might happen and taking appropriate steps. I know, I know you will keep us updated as, as changes are made, but I'm, again, I'm thinking of the, the guy that's working at the restaurant that all of a sudden is not working at the restaurant anymore and his water bill and electric bill and mm -hmm. all those things are going to be coming due mm -hmm. and we're going to have to have at least some sort of a plan of how we're going to work with those people and assist to get them through that period of time, either, you know, waive late fees or I don't know what it's going to be, but I, and I know y'all are talking about that, but I would like to be kept up to speed on that as we, as Absolutely. we go Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Do you have another one? That was it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Danny. Greg, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank uh, you. Do we have a motion to go into executive session related to 551072551087? I'll make a motion that we adjourn to executive session under sections 551.072 <laughs> to 551.087. I'll second that. All right. All in favor, let it be known by the raised hand. Okay, good. Okay. And we will we'll adjourn to executive up, session. Up, upstairs. Upstairs, yeah. yes. There is no action to report out of the executive session, and we are adjourned at 1127.